Hello and welcome back to week three of Philosophy of Religion. This week we'll be looking at arguments for the existence of God. And these are often considered to be a cornerstone of the philosophy of religion. And I used to think of them of that way as well. But now I think too much emphasis is placed on them. Why do I think that? Well, let's start with an observation, which is that both historically and today, it's not through arguments and proofs that people have tended to accept a religion, or in fact to reject a religion. Instead, people tend to accept or reject religion for entirely different reasons. As we all know, upbringing plays a huge part. Those raised in Jewish households are more likely to adopt Judaism. Those raised in Christian households are more likely to adopt Christianity. And those raised in atheist households are more likely to adopt atheism. There are other root, uh, roots to belief, of course. The testimony of others might be enough for some people. A religious experience might do it for others. But what people tend not to do is endorse religious belief by a careful, measured weighing of the evidence for and against. And I think it's unfortunate that over the centuries that some theists have given the impression that this is precisely how one can arrive at it. It's all the more unfortunate given that those who have developed the arguments for God's existence did not themselves arrive at their belief in God through those arguments. And in treating belief in God as the natural outcome of an argument, these thinkers have given the impression that whether God exists or not is a sort of scientific question, the sort of question that can be decided by positive or negative evidence, by arguments for and against. And of course, we've become accustomed to thinking of the issue of God's existence in precisely this way. But I don't think I'm saying anything uncontroversial when I say, as I already have, that believers have not typically arrived at their belief in God through these arguments. And I wonder if any believer has, in fact. Certainly you don't seem to come across many cases of it. I've looked around quite a bit over, over the years, and I've come across three possible cases in which someone may have been convinced to believe in God through a philosophical argument. But all of these cases are a bit doubtful. One is the case of Anthony Flew, which we saw back in week one in the lecture on agnosticism. So as we saw then, late in his life, Flew declared that he had abandoned his atheism and was now a believer in God. And he credited forms of the cosmological and teleological arguments for his conversion. But despite what Flew said, the case is not clear-cut. As I mentioned back in week one, there is some controversy over whether Flew's conversion was actually genuine. Some have claimed that it wasn't. Some said it's just a sad case of an old man with failing powers being taken advantage of by someone with an agenda. Flew actually denied this, but that didn't stop the rumour mill. Now, another case where someone has said that their belief in God came about because of arguments for God's existence, this is a scholar called Edward Fieser, who's a well-known philosopher of religion today. In a short autobiographical essay, he claims that he was raised a Catholic, but he lost his faith at university. And he credits Aquinas' arguments for God's existence, the five ways for reigniting his Catholic faith. But again, this isn't a clear-cut case of someone being swayed into religious belief simply by philosophical arguments. It's actually clear when you read his essay that Faser was never comfortable in his atheism. And he also hints at there being other reasons for his return to Catholicism. And this makes you wonder whether he was really converted by Aquinas' arguments, as he seems to suggest at times, or whether he was more inclined to consider Aquinas' arguments convincing once he had already rejoined the Catholic fold for different reasons. The chances are we'll never know for sure. Now there's a third case in which it's possible that someone had been led to religious belief 
by a philosophical argument, and we'll get to that later in this week's podcasts. So there are, as far as I know, only a handful of cases where someone may have been led to believe in God through philosophical arguments. But none of those is unproblematic. And I'd be wary of saying that any of them capture a genuine case of someone coming to believe in God through philosophical proofs. They might do, but I think that's all we really can say. In any event, even if all of those three cases there are genuine, well, that would still be a pretty poor success rate for philosophical arguments for God's existence. When you think about how many arguments have been devised and how many people have been exposed to them over hundreds if not thousands of years. In the next podcast, I'll say more about why these arguments have proved so unsuccessful in convincing people to believe in God. But for now, let's just get a sense of the sort of arguments that are around before we look more deeply into different forms of the cosmological argument, which is our topic for this podcast. So theists have constructed numerous arguments to support their belief that God exists. So the most well-known ones are the first three displayed on the screen. There's the ontological proof, and this one attempts to show that God's nature is such that it must, so God logically must exist. It was developed by St. Anselm in the 12th century, and there are modified versions available too that were developed and endorsed by Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, and various others. Then we have the cosmological proof, which is what we're looking at today. This has got a very long history, goes back at least as far as Plato, and its popularity was such that it's been endorsed by pagans, so think of the Greeks, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And of the various philosophers who've endorsed it, well, we've got Plato, we've got Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Samuel Clarke, many, many others. And then the third proof is uh, the teleological proof, which you may have come across before under the name of the design argument, or the argument from design. So this argument focuses on evidence of order and purpose in the universe, and it seeks to show that the best explanation for this is a designer, usually taken to be God. And this one has a long history as well. It was very popular with the Greeks. Plato endorsed it. It's in Roman literature as well. It's in Cicero. It was very popular in the early modern period. The teleological proof was, in fact, at the heart of the natural theology movement, which attempts to develop knowledge of God through reason and experience. And it's had quite a number of famous adherents along the way. William Paley is an obvious one. You might have encountered him before if you studied this at A-level. But there were plenty of others who endorsed this argument. Francois Fenelon, Isaac Newton, Samuel Clarke, Fontenelle, Voltaire, many others. So those first three traditional proofs of God's existence were all given their names by Immanuel Kant in his Critique of Pure Reason. Before that, the proofs just didn't have a name. So people discussing the ontological proof would say, for example, they would just say that they would call it Anselm's proof. Or, more convoluted, they would sometimes say it was the proof developed by Anselm and revived by Descartes. And probably a word about terminology is in order here as well. Uh, we call some of these arguments proofs. That doesn't mean that they're logical demonstrations or even that they're intending to be logical demonstrations. The one exception there would be the ontological proof, which does attempt to offer a demonstration for the existence of God. But the other ones seek to constitute evidence for God's existence rather than a, a demonstration as such. So when we call them proofs, we're using the word proof in that sense of evidence or argument, and that's the original sense of the word proof in English. So if you want to have a look back at Samuel Johnson's dictionary, you'll see um, what I'm saying there. So originally, proof meant argument or evidence rather than demonstration, which, of, which is the more modern sense of the term. So the ontological, cosmological, and teleological proofs 
are probably the most famous of the arguments for God's existence, but by no means do they exhaust the proofs for God's existence that philosophers and theologians have developed. There are plenty of others as well. So there's the argument from religious experiences. There's the ex consensu gentium argument, which means from the consensus of the people. There's the argument from eternal truths, the argument from consciousness, and the argument from universal society, which we'll actually look at in the next podcast. And there are many others besides those. Now, our focus is going to be on the cosmological proof in this podcast. Although the name might suggest, because it's singular, it might suggest just one single argument or proof, the cosmological proof is, in fact, a family of different arguments, all of which follow the same basic pattern. And the same, and the basic pattern is this. A cosmological proof is one that begins with the existence of some feature or aspect of reality, or even the entire universe, and then it works back to God as the ultimate explanation for it. So some cosmological proofs focus on change, some focus on contingency, while other ones are more esoteric. And so here you might want to think of Descartes' cosmological proof in the third meditation, which we would have encountered last year in Introduction to History of Philosophy. Descartes' cosmological proof there starts with his idea of God and then works its way through quite tortuously. Um, Descartes tries to show that he could only have obtained this idea through God. Therefore, God must exist. But Kant, who coined the very term cosmological proof, he claimed that the proof went like this. And this is the quotation on the screen. He said, if something exists, then an absolutely necessary being also has to exist. Now, I myself at least exist. Therefore, an absolutely necessary being exists. Now, curiously, this looks to be Kant's own formulation of the argument, rather than one that was used by anybody else. And Kant does seem to say that this is Leibniz's version of the cosmological proof, but Kant's version looks absolutely nothing like Leibniz's, as we'll see, because we'll look at Leibniz's later on. Although it may not be immediately apparent from the structure, Kant's version of the proof is about contingency. The idea at the heart of it is that a necessary being, God, has to be invoked to explain contingency, like the contingency of my own existence. And we know that my own existence is contingent because, well, we know it's not necessary because it's perfectly possible that I might not have existed. Anyway, we won't go into that any further. What we're going to do now is consider two forms of the cosmological proof. The first is the so-called Kalam argument, which was popular amongst medieval Muslims like Al-Ghazali. It's still defended by philosophers today. And the second version of the argument that we'll look at was put forward by the philosopher and mathematician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And this too is still defended today. So let's begin with the Kalam argument. The basic thrust of the Kalam cosmological argument is that the world must have been caused to exist. As I've mentioned, the argument was popular amongst medieval Islamic philosophers, but it originated a bit earlier than that. William Lane Craig and J.P. Morland, they are contemporary defenders of the Kalam argument, and they formulate it like this. The first premise goes, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The second premise is that the universe began to exist, and the conclusion is that therefore the universe has a cause. Now in that formulation, the argument is a straightforward deductive syllogism, consisting of a general principle, which is the first premise, and then a specific case to which the principle is applied, and that's the second premise. And together they generate the conclusion. 
Needless to say, the conclusion that the universe has a cause says nothing about what exactly that cause is, or what it's like. And clearly the god of classical theism is one candidate for this cause, because god is traditionally thought of as being the creator of the universe. But even if he hadn't been thought of in that way, we could still make a plausible case that he should be considered as such, because on account of his being omnipotent and omniscient, he would have the power and the knowledge required to create a universe. Whether there are other plausible candidates for this cause of the universe is difficult to say. Certainly, if we're looking for a cause of the universe, it makes sense to be thinking of someone or something that could exist outside of it, because the only other candidates would be causes that operate in the universe. But how could a cause in the universe be a cause of the universe? So I think we are probably looking at something that it would exist outside of the universe to explain it. So let's go further now into the argument itself. What grounds are there for supposing that the two premises of the Kalam argument are true? First of all, consider premise one. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Why should we consider that to be true? Well, it's tempting to try to establish it inductively. In other words, by just reeling off a list of things that have begun to exist and are known to have a cause. And if we were to attempt such a list, it would probably be a very long one, because it would include all animals, plants, artifacts, and so on. But we need to remember that the premise here, whatever begins to exist has a cause, is intended to be a universal principle. It applies to everything, and as such, it would be impossible to establish it a posteriori through experience, because, of course, our experience doesn't reach to all places and all times. As such, experience cannot confirm that whatever begins to exist has a cause is a principle with universal application within the world. In any case, the aim is not to establish that the principle applies within the world, you know, within our universe, but the aim is in fact to try to establish that it has a truly universal application within the world and without it, outside it as well, if there is an outside. That's a truly universal application. Craig and Morland actually note that this principle, whatever begins to exist has a cause, they say that's a metaphysical principle. In other words, it applies beyond physics to the whole of reality. And this means that experience will be incapable of establishing the truth of the principle, because experience is limited to the physical domain, isn't it? Whereas the principle is not. If the principle cannot be established a posteriori, then the only other way to establish it would be a priori. Now, there are various ways of establishing truths and principles a priori, independently of experience. Deductive reasoning is one way, Intuition is another. And in this case, proponents of the Kalam argument claim that the principle in premise one can be established via intuition. In other words, they suppose that this principle is true and its truth is self-evident, such that we can just see that the principle is true, as it were. And Craig and Morland, they argue like this. They say that the principle Whatever begins to exist has a cause. They say that principle is equivalent to saying that something cannot come into existence uncaused from nothing. Now, for centuries, philosophers have claimed that principles very similar to these are intuitively obvious. Descartes, for example, claimed that it's very evident by the natural light, in other words, by reason, that nothing comes from nothing. And this looks to be the same principle that Craig and Morland claim to be intuitively obvious. Now, it might be thought that quantum physics is a counterexample to this principle. But how clear is it that it is 
Only on one interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation, do uncaused things take place. But even then, is this something actually beginning to exist? Or is it a change of orbits or a change of states? And this interpretation, Copenhagen interpretation, as famous as it is, is apparently very far from being universally supported by physicists. In any case, for philosophers it's often best to avoid piggybacking arguments or objections on the current thinking of science. Okay, so we've had a little look at the first premise of the Kalam argument. Now the second premise. The second premise says that the universe began to exist. Now one might think that there's good evidence for this in the Big Bang Theory, which has served as the standard model of cosmology for many decades. In this model, the universe is said to have begun to exist around 15 billion years ago, in an, in an event which saw the creation of all space, time and matter. However, to pick up the threads of a point I made in the, on the last slide, many philosophers tend to be wary of resting too much on the current findings of science. For one thing, lacking advanced training in science as they do, they often consider themselves to be ill-equipped to grasp the finer points of scientific theories. And this is fair enough. This stuff is fiendishly complicated. It cannot possibly be grasped from newspaper articles or fluffy documentaries and pop science books, which is how most non-scientists get their knowledge of current scientific thinking. And the second reason why philosophers tend to be wary about relying too much on current science for their philosophical theories is that they're well aware that the current state of science is very likely to change. Scientific theories are not set in stone. They can and do change in light of new research. They're even superseded by different theories. So it's problematic to point to a theory that's in vogue with scientists at a particular time and treat it as if it was some kind of hard and fast fact that was perfect in every detail, because that's not the case. And it's very interesting to see how all this is handled in the readings for this topic. In the paper by Craig and Morland, they mentioned the Big Bang Theory, if true, would support their premise too. But they don't say much more about it because they recognise that the science is fluid and it's not their area. And likewise, a guy called Draper in a paper that attacks Craig and Morland, well he says that he won't discuss the science because he's not equipped to do so. So there's no attempt really to give scientific backing for premise two, but Craig and Morland do offer philosophical grounds for it as well. The most interesting argument they offer attempts to establish that the universe began to exist by ruling out the alternative position of it having existed forever. So obviously there are two possible options here. Either the universe existed forever or it began to exist. And obviously if they can show that the universe cannot have existed forever, then they will have shown that it began to exist. So why then can it not be the case that the universe existed forever? Well, Craig and Morland's argument is that if the universe had existed forever, then an actual infinite would exist. In this case, it would be an actual infinite regress of physical events. So this is the argument they give. Again, it's in premises and conclusion form. First of all, the premise says an actual infinite cannot exist. The second premise says an infinite temporal regress of physical events is an actual infinite. And that gives us the conclusion that therefore an infinite temporal regress of physical events cannot exist. And this is another deductive syllogism. In the argument, premise two looks pretty straightforward, because if the world had existed forever, there would have been an infinite temporal regress of physical events. In other words, physical events causing physical events, causing physical events, going all the way back forever with no first physical event. And also, this would be an actual infinite, 
as opposed to a potential infinite. So what's the difference between the two? Well, a potential infinite is a series that has the potential to be continually increased forever. But at any given time is always finite. An actual infinite, on the other hand, is a series which is actually infinite in extent. So it has infinitely many members. So an example of the potential infinite might be the number of years that have that have elapsed after 1000 um, AD. So at the moment, how many have elapsed? 1010 have elapsed. But in a million years, it will be a million and ten, say. Um, and then in a billion years, it will be a billion and ten. But you can potentially increase the number forever. But it remains the case that at any given point, the number will always be finite. But an example of an actual infinite would be the set of natural numbers. So the set of numbers that goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So Craig and Morland, what they do, what they argue in premise 1, they say that an actual infinite cannot exist. They attempt to establish this by showing the, that absurdities will result if actual infinities are allowed to exist. And they try to do this using the example of Hilbert's Hotel. Now, if you've not come across this before, I think this is absolutely fascinating. Hilbert's Hotel um, is an idea that was devised by the 20th century mathematician David Hilbert. To illustrate what's involved in Hilbert's Hotel, suppose first of all that a man called Hilbert opens a hotel with just a single room. However, he then starts to add more rooms. In theory, at least, there's no clear limit to the number of rooms that could be added to the hotel. Though, of course, at any given point, the number would always be a potential infinite. In other words, he'd always have a finite number of rooms, but there would be the potential for it to be con increased continually. Now, this example seems to make sense. The main, main objection to it would be, Sooner or later, Hilbert's just going to run out of space, and he's going to end up with a very large hotel, but clearly not one with an actual infinite number of rooms. So the idea of a hotel with a potentially infinite number of rooms seems unproblematic. Now we have to contrast this with the idea of a hotel with an actually infinite number of rooms. And this is the true Hilbert's Hotel. In this scenario, we are asked to suppose that Hilbert has a hotel with an infinite number of rooms. So there's an actual infinite there. We're also asked to suppose that all of the rooms are occupied by guests. Now suppose a new guest arrives at the front desk and asks for a room. Because of the nature of the actual infinite, Hilbert would be able to accommodate this new guest. And he does that by asking the guest in room 1 to move to room 2. He asks the guest in room 2 to move to room 3. The guest in room 3 to move to room 4 and so on and so on. And what this does is free up room 1 for the new guest. Further, it's possible to accommodate infinitely many new guests in the exact same way. And to make matters even more perplexing, the nature of the actual infinite is such that the number of guests in the hotel would remain the same, no matter whether an extra one, two, or even an infinity of new guests comes to stay. Although this seems absurd, all this is a natural consequence of infinite set theory. To put it bluntly, the properties of infinite sets are completely different from finite sets. And it's because of the absurdities that Craig and Morland reject the idea of an actual infinite. They allow that infinite set theory is a well-developed branch of mathematics, but they claim that because its results are so counterintuitive, that it's merely a universe of discourse, as they call it, and so it has no application to the real world. Now, if they're right about this, then it follows that there cannot be an actual infinite. In which case, it also follows 
that there could not have been an infinite regress of physical events, in which case the universe must have had a beginning. And that gives us the second premise of the Kalam proof. Now if the two premises of the argument of the Kalam proof are accepted, then the conclusion follows that the universe has a cause. But as I've noted, this says nothing about the nature of the cause, and it falls short of specifically identifying the cause as the god of classical theism, or any other conception of god for that matter. Nevertheless, the conclusion that the universe has a cause would be a welcome one for theists, hopefully for obvious reasons. Okay, so that's the Kalam argument. We won't say any more about that. Let's move on now to Leibniz's version of the cosmological proof. Now this is encapsulated in that huge quotation on the screen. So let's go through it. Leibniz says this, Besides the world, or aggregate of finite things, there is some single dominant being. Not only is the soul is dominant in me, or rather as I myself am dominant in my body, but also in a much more noble way. For the universe's single dominant being not only rules the world, but also constructs or makes it, and is superior to the world, and, so to speak, extra mundane and is thus the ultimate reason of things. For a sufficient reason for existence cannot be found in any single thing alone, or in the whole aggregate and series of things. So let's imagine that the book of the elements of geometry has existed eternally, one always copied from another. It's evident that even if a reason can be given for the present book, from a past one, from which it was copied, Nevertheless, we shall never come, across, come upon a full reason, no matter how many past books we assume, since it's always possible to wonder why such books have existed from all time, why books existed at all, and why they were written in this way. And what is true of books is also true of the different states of the world. For a subsequent state is, in a way, copied from a preceding one, albeit according to certain laws of change. And so, however far back you go to earlier states, you'll never find in those states a full reason why there should be any world rather than none, and why it should be such as it is. So even if you should imagine the world eternal, it's evident that the reason for it must be sought elsewhere, since you're still assuming only a succession of states, and you will not find a sufficient reason in any of them, and indeed, no matter how many states you assume, you will not make even the slightest progress towards giving a reason. From this, it is evident that not even by supposing the eternity of the world can we escape the ultimate extra-mundane reason of things, namely God. So hopefully it should be clear from that, at least, that... Leibniz's version of the cosmological proof is about reasons or explanations rather than causes. And hopefully it should also be clear that it's got nothing to do with the nature of infinity either. So we're dealing here with a very different form of cosmological argument from the Kalam argument, which we looked at earlier. So let's go a bit further into Leibniz's argument now. I always find it helpful to try and put these arguments into premises and conclusion form, uh, to give it a more formal structure so we can see exactly how it's all supposed to work. If you look at the notes for the week, you'll, what you'll see is I've tried to color code. So I've uh, highlighted certain passages from the quotation in particular color, and then I've put the some of the premises here uh, in that same color so you can actually see where the premises are in the actual big passage that we've just looked at. But effectively this is how the argument is structured. So first of all there is a world, then the second premise would be there must be a sufficient reason why there's a world rather than nothing at all. Then the third re premise would be that this reason cannot be found in anything that exists in the world or anything that happens in the world. 
And the fourth premise is going to be, therefore, this reason can only be found in something that is outside of the world. That's the, the meaning of the term extra mundane, outside the world. So the fourth premise, therefore, this reason can only be found in something that's outside of the world and all the things in it. The fifth premise is that this reason is God, and that generates the conclusion that, therefore, God exists. Now, therefore, I know I've whipped through that rather quickly, but we're going to look through it now in more detail. So the first premise of Leibniz's argument is that there is a world. Now, Leibniz doesn't really argue for this so much as he just assumes it, though it seems defensible enough, given that even the most awkward opponent you could possibly imagine is likely to make the same assumption. So perhaps we should give him that. The second premise is that there must be a sufficient reason why there is a world rather than nothing at all. Now, this isn't stated explicitly in Leibniz's presentation of the argument, though it is clearly assumed. There's other writings, other formulations of this argument where Leibniz is rather more explicit about this. Now, this claim that there has to be a sufficient reason why that there's a world rather than nothing at all, I think it's got great intuitive appeal. You know, so to many people, it just seems obvious. Well, yeah, there has to be a reason why something, why our world exists rather than nothing. Not all agree with that, of course. Um, you may remember, if you've read this before, Bertrand Russell, he famously denied that the existence of the universe required an explanation. So for him, he just said, I should say that the universe is just there and that's all. But that's an awkward position because then it just leaves something hanging, doesn't it? We, we kind of feel there ought to be some kind of explanation. And Russell's basically just saying there isn't. But he's got no basis for saying that either. So it's an intuitively appealing idea. There's got to be an explanation for why there's a world rather than nothing. And Leibniz tries to, well, Leibniz appeals to his principle of sufficient reason to support premise two. The principle of sufficient reason is formulated in various different ways. So he could say nothing exists without a reason, nothing happens without there being a reason, or a reason can be given for every truth. Right? He formulates it in all sorts of different ways. But I think the first formulation there, nothing exists without reason, or rather there's always a reason why. I think that's the formulation that best applies to his version of the cosmological proof. Because the proof, of course, concerns the existence of the world. It's not really about a particular happening or a particular fact. It's about the existence of the world. So his principle of sufficient reason holds that nothing exists without reason, or there's always a reason why. Again, it's one of those principles that I think has great intuitive appeal. Sometimes Leibniz makes empirical appeals in favor of the principle of sufficient reason. So, for example, he would say that it, it succeeds in all known cases. Or it could be that no exceptions to it have ever been found. Now, appeals like that, they clearly sh fall short of justification. They don't prove the principle. But I don't think they were intended to be a proof anyway. But they do help to increase the intuitive appeal of the principle. If you can just accept that it succeeds in all known cases and doesn't have any exceptions that we know of. But again, it doesn't prove the principle. So let's turn now to premise three of Leibniz's argument. This one says that this reason why there's a world rather than nothing cannot be found in anything that exists in the world or anything that happens in the world. Now, the claim here is really worth going over quite carefully. To illustrate it, let's just take a particular state of the world, such as the state of the world this morning at 10 a.m. And think of the state of the world as being like a kind of snapshot that captures the contents of the world, so all the things that are in it, and their locations. Okay, that's the state of the world. Now, Leibniz says that the reason the state of the world was what it was at that time can be found 
in the state of the world immediately beforehand and the laws of nature that were in operation at that moment. So, the reason the state of the world at 10 a.m. this morning was what it was is due to the laws of nature acting on the state of the world immediately before 10 a.m. And so on and so on. So the reason for each state of the world can be found in the laws of nature acting upon the state of the world that occurred immediately beforehand. And this holds good no matter how far back one goes. But Leibniz's point is that even though we can find the reason for any given state of the world, and we can do that just by referring to the laws of nature acting upon the state of the world that obtained immediately beforehand. Right? So Leibniz allows that we can find the reason for any given state of the world. We could collect all of those reasons together to explain all of the states of the world, he says. But that is still going to leave us short of a reason for why there's a world at all. Because the reasons we've collected together tell us why the successive states of the world are as they are. But not why there's a world rather than nothing at all. An interesting thing to note here is Leibniz's claim that it makes no difference to his argument whether the world is eternal or not. His point is that even if the world is eternal, and the reason for each state can be found in the state immediately prior to that, each of these states only enables us to explain the next one. They still don't explain why there's a world in the first place. So it doesn't matter whether there have been an infinity of successive states or not, because although each one is explained by the one before it, and this may go on forever, all these states can give us are reasons for other states of the world, and not the reason why there's a world rather than nothing. And this is quite an important step. A common feature of cosmological proofs is that there cannot be an infinite regress of reasons or causes or explanations, and that because of this the world must have had a beginning. So we've already seen something like that in the Kalam argument, but Leibniz's argument is different. And this is no doubt because he was aware of the possible objection to such arguments. If an argument says that there cannot be an infinite regress of causes or explanations, someone will come along and challenge that and say that there can. Leibniz's argument sidesteps this challenge completely without having to go into the nature of the infinite as the Kalam argument does. Leibniz's argument says, in effect, that it makes no difference whether there is or is not an infinite regress of explanations. And it makes no difference whether the world did or did not have a beginning. Because either way, it's just states of the world explaining other states of the world. And these, whether we take it in isolation or we collect them all together, still do not explain. They do not give us a reason why there's a world rather than nothing. Okay, we move on now to premise four of Leibniz's argument. So premise four says, therefore, this reason for the world can only be found in something that is outside of the world and all of the things in it. And that seems like a pretty obvious step. If there's got to be a reason for the world, which we're told by premise two, and there has to be a reason, and, and that, sorry, and that this reason cannot be found in the world, and premise three told us that, then it must be found outside the world. So if there's got to be a reason for the world, and the reason cannot be found in the world, then obviously it's got to be found outside the world. No other possible option there. And then premise five of the argument is this reason is God. So here Leibniz is identifying God as the reason for the world. Now this might seem to be a bit of a leap, especially since by God, Leibniz means the omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good being of classical theism. So if we look back to premise four of the argument, it just says that there must be some extra mundane reason, some reason for the world that exists outside the world. And as things stand, one might object to Leibniz's assumption that this extra mundane reason, 
is the god of classical theism. You know, presumably it could be, but Leibniz has said nothing to support that contention. And this happens often with proofs of the existence of God. The fault lies not with the proof, but rather with those who use it. People are apt to get a little bit carried away sometimes. If we're being strict about it, then technically premise 5 should disappear altogether, and the conclusion of Leibniz's argument should be that therefore there exists an extra mundane reason for the world. That should be the conclusion of his argument. There exists an extra mundane reason for the world. Now after that, it's up to Leibniz to show this, that this extra mundane reason is God. But that's going to have to be a separate argument. As it is, he includes what looks to be an illegitimate step in his argument. If you've read any of the classic authors on the proofs for God's existence, you'll notice this sort of thing happening a lot. The Kalam argument technically gives you only an uncaused first cause of the universe. And as I've said, that may be the god of classical theism, but it's not immediately obvious that it is, or that it has to be. That needs to be argued for. But curiously, I don't think it ever is. And to compound matters, you'll also notice that Jewish thinkers tend to suppose that these proofs for God lead to the god of Judaism, while Christian thinkers tend to suppose that the proofs lead to the god of Christianity and so on. But again, I should know, that's not really a fault with the proof itself. It's rather with those who use it. In any case, one could say in Leibniz's defence that God is traditionally conceived as being outside the world, and it's hard to think of what else would be. On that basis, perhaps Leibniz's introduction of God in the fifth premise is pardonable, at least to some extent. But could there be a potential problem with Leibniz's argument here? Well, think of it like this. We've already seen Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason tell us that nothing exists without a reason. Okay, Nothing exists without a reason. That's part of the argument that Leibniz has put forward. Now, this principle that nothing exists without a reason is clearly intended to be universal. Okay, It applies to everything without exception. And that means it must also apply to the extra mundane cause of the world, which Leibniz has identified as God. In other words, there must be a reason why God exists. But now it looks to be the start of an infinite regress, because suppose that the reason why God exists is because another God, say God too, created him. Maybe that's the reason why God exists. We would then have to ask why God too exists. And this might lead us to say that the reason is that God 3 created him, with God 4 in turn creating God 3, and so on. And clearly this is going to be a very unwelcome development, especially if one wants to identify the extra mundane reason for the world as the god of classical theism, as Leibniz wants to do. And curiously, it's the principle of sufficient reason, which is at the heart of Leibniz's cosmological proof, that is responsible for this unfortunate scenario because it demands that every existing thing have a reason. So how big a problem is this? Well Leibniz himself didn't think that there was a problem here. On the question of whether there's a reason for God's existence, Leibniz says that there is a reason for God's existence. Right? He can't really say anything else. The principle of sufficient reason is universal, so there's got to be a reason for God's existence. But what Leibniz says is that the reason for God's existence isn't to be found in a God 2 or God 3 or God 4 or whatever. No, the reason for God's existence is to be found within God himself by virtue of his being a necessary being. So Leibniz says that a necessary being has the reason for its existence in itself. And sometimes Leibniz refers to God as causa sui, the Latin term. It literally means cause of himself. 
But it doesn't mean that God literally caused himself to exist. We're obviously going to think of that as being quite an odd idea, aren't we? No, the term causa sui really just refers to the idea that God is self-explanatory. And God is self-explanatory because he's a necessary being. The very nature of a necessary being is such that existence pertains to its essence, which is why it's necessary in the first place, and hence why it exists. So, according to Leibniz's version of the cosmological argument, the sufficient reason for the universe is God, who is also his own sufficient reason.